Welcome to MJB, Paris Thimmon. Hello. For those who don't know, played Mike TV on one of the most iconic movies, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Thank you. Oh, I actually have this here. Hang on. Look, in case someone's a little not quite sure who that is. Oh, boy. Oh, here we go in Zoom days. You can't quite see it. But anyway, that's it. That's awesome. See, get the cowboy hat in there. Yes, I did. And it was a long time ago. In fact, 50 years ago. And I have to say, it's there's two iconic movies, like two of the most classic movies in the world, one being The Wizard of Oz and the other, Willy Wonka. Thank you. I'm always very complimented when somebody draws that conclusion, as you could probably do with a quick abacus. If the movie's 50 and I'm 11, or I was 11 in the film, that means I'm 61 now. The Wizard of Oz in 1939. So I wasn't around when that came out, but uh, certainly when I was 11, for instance, that was the film. It was the one that they only showed once on TV, once a year. You couldn't, there were obviously no uh, DVDs or Blu-rays or anything like that. And that was annual appointment TV. And to me, it was absolutely one of the, and still is one of the most iconic films ever. Because I have a different perspective on it than you, I still can't bring myself to equate the two because how could that be? It just doesn't make sense. But I'm happy to have you do it. And it uh, makes me smile when you do it. That's no, amazing. And, um, you know, my daughter, who's nine, still watches those two movies, The Wizard of Oz and Willy Wonka. Right. The old one, okay. right? We don't talk about that other one, the Voldemort of Willy Wonka films. That was just... Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Again, you know, here we have the same situation. So yeah. happy to hear you say it. Uh, Julie Don Cole, who played Veruca Salt, and I uh, do this thing at the Alamo Drafthouse Movie Theaters. Uh, yep. I don't think they're in Australia yet, but they're all over America. And right now, uh, because of COVID, uh, they're probably having a very difficult time. Julie and I will not be doing a tour of the uh, Alamo Drafthouse movie theaters this year, unfortunately. But when we do, we open it out to the audience for questions and someone will inevitably say, excuse me, uh, so uh, what did you guys think of, uh, of the new version? And Julie and I go, what? I'm sorry. We look at each other. I'm sorry. He sounded like he, the new one, new, oh, like a new Willie, I'm sorry, I, could, does anybody have a real question, you know, and we just play it off like we've never heard of it, that's, that's our, that's our take on it, is like, it just, it just doesn't exist to us. Yeah, some movies should just not be redone, it's like trying to make the, the remake of The Wizard of Oz. I think they're doing it now, I've, I've heard that maybe, they're, well, they're doing some kind of an Oz project, for sure, mm. and they're also, uh, Amazon, by the way, is going to do a prequel, to Lord of the Rings, which is my favorite book of the 20th century. I mean, I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Actually, I've read it once for every decade of my life. So I do now, I'm 61, I need to read it for my 60s. Starting in, let's say, my teens on, I read it. So they're doing that and that's a prequel. I understand that, I think it's Amazon again, is working on a Willy Wonka prequel. I read that, yeah. Yeah, and I also know that there is a Wizard of Oz project. I think it might be a prequel as well, but don't hold me to that. You know, it's money. People, they want the money. They know they have a built-in audience. I mean, the, the, in a sense, the bar is lower. If they do a good job, they're going to do okay. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying that this is the thought process of film producers. Uh, if you have an entirely new project, it has to be very good, and then, you know, you're going to do well. But yeah. something like Wizard of Oz, the curiosity factor is going to be a baseline where people are going to show up just to just to see what it looks like. Your background, I mean, as a, as a child before Willy Wonka, so your your mom and dad were involved in music. Music, that's true. Yeah. First of all, my mother and father went to the New England Conservatory of Music, which again, you probably wouldn't know what that is, but it's in Boston. I come from a multi sort of typical American, English, Irish, German, Russian, French, French, Dutch, you know, American, right? Like Jewish on my mother's side and, and Goy, as they say, on my dad's side. Yeah, so he was a, a conductor and a clarinetist. He was a beautiful clarinetist. He played in Boston with the Boston Symphony and the Boston Pops. He was the music administrator at American Ballet Theater for many years and conducted. So he was, you know, the real deal there. And my mom, at a time when very few people were, uh, w women, I should say, were composing. She was the first woman to win a Kennedy Award in, in Washington as a composer. So she was a pianist and a composer. So there were serious New York and Boston classical musicians. And as it relates to Willy Wonka, they would play in pits. Uh, if you know what a pit is in the theater, right? So the, the, the orchestra is in a pit. So they would play in the pit in Broadway shows and in other shows around New York. 
So they were in the entertainment scene, even though you don't really think of a classical musician as being in, you know, sort of pop culture. One day, my mom brought my sister to an agent, and that was my older sister. I was just sort of along for the ride. And after they talked about her, the agent said, well, what about him? We were like, yeah, you know, we'll try. So I started going out for commercials. The first thing I did was a Jif peanut butter commercial. I was on top of a mountain of peanuts, and I, you know. So the second one was Crazy Bubbles. I was still six years old and it was a crazy bubbles. I was the only kid that they saw that could say crazy bubbles, bubble blowing bubble bath. Three times fast. And so since I could do that, then they hired me. I still have the footage. Actually, that commercial. See, I'm at my desk. I have everything right at my fingertips. That commercial is right here. I need to take this commercial and I need to send it to one of those places where they'll make it digital. Yeah. But I've looked and that's what it is, right? It's uh, it's crazy bubbles. Anyway, I, of course, with my lisp, I said crazy bubble, bubble blowing, bubble bath. And I just kept booking commercials. I was booking. I had that sort of odd voice that you heard in Willy Wonka with the lisp and da, da, da. I sounded sort of precocious and blah, blah, like that. And so I did a lot of voiceovers and I got to be eight and I did my first Broadway show. Uh, it was called MAME. You know, the thing about my career is that there's a lot. After MAME, I eventually did the Rothschilds on Broadway. I booked that at the same time that I booked Willy Wonka and I had to choose. And we went to Germany and shot Willy Wonka. And then one of the kids from Willy Wonka, I mean, uh, the Rothschilds left. So when I came back, I went into that role in the Rothschilds and then on the national tour, et cetera, et cetera. So what was it like at that age to be on Broadway? You know, I was at a place called Professional Children's School. I went in New York City. There's a thing called Professional Children's School. Okay. So they, they found a need and they filled it. And that need was child actors, professional actors. So on Wednesdays, I would have to leave school early. Bye guys, no history for me or whatever it is. And I would get on a bus and I would go downtown to the theater district and I'd perform on a Wednesday matinee, et cetera, et cetera. That was different. Uh, on, on, the, on the set of Willy Wonka, there was a tutor who okay. would teach us so that we didn't get behind when we, I was there for nine weeks in Munich. And we all had to go to school and do that. It's hard to say, you know, it's the same phenomenon as we were talking about with The Wizard of Oz. From the perspective of someone who isn't on Broadway, it's like eight days a week, you would go and they would, you'd have to be there on time. You're only 14 if for the Rothschilds or eight for MAME, right? Yeah. You have to be there on time. You got to get in your makeup. You got to know your thing. You're putting on your looking, right? Like an actor would do. You go on stage, there's, I don't know, 1,500 people in a Broadway house, something like that. You do your thing in the way that child actors do, because really they're just making believe. It's not a career. It's, it's, it's make believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you go, you do some make believe, you try to get your laughs. You don't forget your lines because you usually don't have a part that's big enough. And it's insane. Right? That's crazy for a kid to do night after night, week after week for a couple of years. But from my perspective, I see how it all went down. I mean, I felt it happen. It's, it's in a sense demystified. I think it was, it's stranger to me now thinking about it than what it was then. Then it was like, this is what I do. You know, I mean, other kids, I was going to say play baseball or football or not, you know, not football, but football. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I did that, too, in the park. I would go out in the park and, and that kind of stuff. But actually, this kind of brings us to our next moment in the in the biography. I got to be about 14. And I said, OK, Mom, I don't want to do this anymore. I was uh, at that point going to what they called an alternative high school. And I lived in New Jersey, which is just outside of New York, where your Sopranos are from. And I had this psychology of a child actor in New York. I hesitate to use the word sophistication, but I was, let's say, to put it nicely, a bit more sophisticated than the New Jersey suburban kids that were just not doing that. And I was more on the hippie side of life. So I was more about throwing a Frisbee and getting stoned and less about drinking beers. So there were a lot of people like me and they made their own high school. There were 80 kids and four core teachers for math, English, history, and science. And then the rest of the classes were taught by people from the town. So there was a a uh, consciousness raising and meditation class that was uh, uh, this nuclear physicist guy that was in town. Alan Alda was in the town. He taught an acting oh, class yeah. and, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, like Tolkien, I got turned on to J.R.R. Tolkien at that time in that school because 
That was in the dreams, visions, and fantasies class, right? Remember, it's 1974. So everything was a little bit psychedelic anyway. So it was fabulous living my life, let's just say, having a good time with my life. And I said, mom, I don't wanna be an actor anymore. So I stopped. I said, no more auditions. I'm growing my hair, believe it or not. My hair was you know, down to here and I had a hairline about here and I stopped. And then I, the next time I got into it was at NYU actually, I needed to do something for my college education. So I got a scholarship in, in theater okay. at NYU and that's what I did next. So going back to, to Willy Wonka, the, yeah. how, did, how did the park come about the audition? So here I am, I'm taking my little uh, uh, valise with the, my portfolio, with my, my photos. I'm walking around to New York. I'm going to a lot of commercial auditions mostly, occasionally theater. You know, I had certain songs that I sang at theater auditions, Where Is Love from Oliver and what have you. But this one was for a movie, which was unusual for me. You know, most of the film production, especially at that time, was in LA, not in New York. Yep. Uh, and I got the call and uh, we knew it was this book, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So we bought a copy. My mom and I read it the night before. I remember the picture that Quentin Blake drew of Mike TV and he's got his bandoleros, he's jumping, his bandoleros across, you know, the guns, he's jumping up and down like this. And that was me, you know, and they actually read me for Charlie as well as Mike TV. So I was the littlest one, right? And um, I think it was clear to them that I wasn't Charlie, probably because of my size and age, but also I think I probably just did a better job being, uh, you know, bratty than I did being, and they had, you know, they had, Let's not forget, they event either, I don't know whether they saw Peter before or after they saw me for okay. Peter's role. It was in a different city. They saw him in Ohio in a place called Shaker Heights where he was doing basically summer stock. Yep. They saw him doing something and that's where they found him there. And at the I time, there was no script at the auditions, was there? I think they just read us out of the book. Yeah. I definitely read the book the night before. I remember going, I remember that they read me for both roles. There was at least one callback. I know the director was there. I actually, because Gene Wilder wasn't a uh, star then, I actually don't remember whether Gene was there or not. I'm guessing not, okay. but the director certainly was there. There was a woman who was a, a famous casting director then, and I had worked for her before and she was familiar with me. Uh, there weren't that many working child actors in New York at that time. There would probably be a lot more, I would say right now, except for not this year, maybe last year. So she was familiar. And so it wasn't a huge cattle call. It wasn't this experience where you walk into a room. I've had that experience many times where you walk into a room and there's 30 other kids that are essentially you. And in fact, you get to know the same kids, right? It's, oh, you're here. Oh, of course you're here, right? Because I always see you all the time, you know, your rivals at that point. There weren't that many people at the, at the auditions that I went to. And as I understand it, I asked the director if they saw a lot of people he said that they hadn't, you know, they hadn't seen a lot of people. And he said he knew right away, you know, like when he saw me that I was, I was going to get it. Maybe I'm forgetting the after part where I'm happy. I mean, eventually I got the call and my mother and I were in a phone booth in the rain. We were very, very happy. We were the first major motion picture. I was going to leave the country and go to Germany, never been to Europe and go with my family. The money was not great. Uh, but I didn't care about that because, you know, I wasn't paying the bills. I made 1500 a week for nine weeks. Which is good money back then. Yeah, but not that many years later, you know, think about Home Alone. Yeah. He raked it in. And not only that, uh, the, all right, I'm going to get a little technical here. Sorry, I'm pulling up my sock. That's, That's okay. right. I'm wearing a sock and no shoes. That's right. That's right. It's COVID days. <laughs> um, the signatory agreement between SAG and the producers for ancillary markets was signed like eight months after I signed my contract. So what does that mean in English? What that means is when they showed it on cable for many years, when it eventually became one of the best-selling VHSs of all time and CDs and Blu-ray and internet, et cetera, et cetera, goose egg, right? If I had signed my contract eight months later after the SAG had the signatory producers had signed their agreement on ancillary markets, payday, 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 payday. So poor me. But anyway, that's just, but I didn't know any of that. I didn't care about any of that. I was just happy. I was just happy to have booked it. I watched an interview with Gene Wilder a while ago on YouTube and he was yeah. talking about all the kids, you know, uh -huh. himself. And he said, yeah. oh, fantastic, but there was a real mischievous kid. What? 
which was you. What? <laughs> so, well, see, that's the way the internet works. I just want to say that people will watch this a half hour of it or whatever, and then they'll be like, Mike TV was on, and they'll be like, really? Let's see a picture. And you know what the picture's going to be? This. <laughs> because right? that's what it is. I can sit here and smile and just be normal for 30 minutes, but all you do is, like, is one moment. Oh, I almost said it. Did you hear me almost say it? I almost cursed. Sorry about that. All you need is one moment where you let your guard down and then that's the screen grab, right? Okay, so sorry. Enough about that. Gene Wilder, yes, he did say that. Yes, Gene said, I've seen it on film. Uh, someone says to him, how do you like working with the kids? And he says, four of them are fantastic and one of them I'm going to strangle in the morning or one of them going to shoot in the head in the morning or something like that. And yes, yes, that was me. It's true. I was not only the smallest, the youngest, I was 11. She was 12. She turned 13 on the day of Golden Goose Room Day, uh, 13. She was 12. He was 12, I think. So I was the youngest, I was the smallest, and I was, uh, honestly, the difference between 11 and 13, it's kind of a big difference. Even now, when you talk to me, if you get me going on the right subject, I'm not a wallflower. I'm not someone who is like, you know, oh yeah, oh, isn't that, it's really fun, you know. I'm expressive. Even if I'm hanging out with the boys, I'm boisterous. So you take that sort of boisterous personality and you put it onto an 11 year old that spent his whole life going to auditions and being put in situations like this one. And what you get is a very spirited kid. So that was me. I have asked others, I mean, I even asked Gene uh, when I saw him once or twice, and I'll talk about that. But I asked, for instance, an Oompa Loompa, uh, uh, Rusty Goff, who's my good friend in England. And he said, no, no, Paris, you were, you were spirited. You were having fun. I asked the director. He said the same thing. He said, no, you weren't tough to work with. It was great. You know, I mean, he could, this is 40 years later. He would have lied to me if he wanted to. He would have just, I mean, he has no reason to lie to me is what I'm saying. He water under the bridge, you know? So I was definitely big. I know that I was big and I, I leave it up to you, uh, viewer, to decide whether I was horrible or whether I was just uh, a spirited kid. But when I saw Gene, uh, I saw him in, it was in Stratford, Connecticut. And Stratford, Connecticut has a place there, which is called the Avon Movie Theater, for obvious reasons. Now, Gene Wilder was someone who, a patron, he was a patron of the Avon Theater in Stratford. They would do something called Wilder's Picks once a year there, and they would show movies with Gene Wilder, and he would be there, and he would do this. What we're doing now, he would do it live in front of the theater. Oh, wow. People would ask questions in the audience. So I got wind of this one year. I mean, I knew it was happening, but one year I went. It was Silver Streak, which I'm sure some of you know. Let me just take a moment in case we don't come back to Gene Wilder. Fantastic actor, one of uh, the best comedic actors ever. I think G Willy Wonka is among his best performances for that. Personally, I love Young Frankenstein. So uh, again, maybe it's that perspective thing, but I mean, I, I think that's even funnier. Uh, but they're both great, and he was he's awesome. Also, personally, he was very nice at the time. I have no horror stories to tell about him or anything like that. Okay, so let's just talk about Gene. I'm sorry he's gone. Yeah. A lot of people really felt it. So that's Gene. So here I am. I'm at, I'm at the thing. I've got my poster of a large three-sheet for the, for the film poster nerds out there. I have a three-sheet with me. It's a large poster. Got it under my arm, and I get up there, and it's my turn to go up I, this is after the Q&A with the audience. We're going to walk up and talk to him. I say, hi, Gene. How you doing? I'm Harris Them, and I was, I was Mike TV and Willie Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you were a brat. And I said, yes, Gene, yes, I'm sure that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm an adult now, and I like to think that maybe, you know, it's 35 years later or something. I, I, you know, I like to think maybe I'm not as much of a brat as I used to be. He said, oh, no, no. Of course, Paris, I, you know, naturally, you know, he took the pen. They signed my poster to my favorite brat. I have it. I don't have that at hand, but it's in the garage. Uh, it's, um, it's, you know, I have it up. It's my poster of Willy Wonka that I have on the wall. There's a story about me theoretically uh, letting out the bee. So well, that relates to this. Honestly, I don't remember doing it. In the inventing room, there are bees in the contraption, which makes the uh, everlasting gobstopper. And there's a dome over a hive of bees. And I got stung here 
on me by a bee. The story goes that I climbed up there, which I was this big. You can't tell, but you've seen the photo. I was this big. Yeah. This thing was up, up there. You, I would have had to literally climb up to there, unless there happened to be a ladder, ladder standing by, which I suppose on a film set would be possible, and take a dome, which was half the size of me, either off or tilt it up so that this theoretical swarm of bees could go all of, this is the way the story goes, all over the film set and everybody, oh, oh, bees, bees. I do not remember doing that. I think that it's an apocryphal tale for the religious geeks out there. It is apocryphal. <laughs> Honestly, I don't remember doing it, but it's a fun story that yeah. obnoxious little Paris them and should have let out the bees. I'm not exactly here to deny it. You know, you would think I would remember these things, but I do have a photo. Oh, wait, hang on. Yeah, you're not gonna, it's not gonna read, I don't think. I'm gonna give you a look at this. There is a, there is a spot on my chin right here. It's too young for acne. I'm gonna bring it really close. Can you see the little spot see, right yeah, there? Like a little dot. It's the bee sting. Yeah. Okay. So that much is true. I did get stung. Your first scene at the house with your on-screen parents and you're, you're watching TV. I read somewhere it took, it was 40 takes for that scene. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. 46 takes. I have a photo, but not with me, it's I've got the clapboard in the photo. It says 46. Yeah, it could have been more. That's just the clapboard of the photo I have. Mel Stewart, uh, this is going to be a German joke, which is lost on most people. But if you say knock on Mal, it means one more time. His name was Mel Stewart. So we called him knock on Mel, which was a German joke for one more time. So Kubrick-like, he used to do a lot of takes. He wanted to get it right. He was also a very angry guy. You know, the people that are super into Wonka will probably see interviews with people that are like, working for Mel was very difficult, you know? And it was, I mean, he ran a tight set. I think there was a walk-off on set of the crew at one point. And if you're a director and everybody else thinks you've got it and you end up getting it another 12 times, you know, tensions run high. People want to go home, et cetera. That definitely was one side of Mel. He's gone now, Mel is gone now. So I don't still meet with him, but I did meet with him afterwards and he was, He's very reasonable. And I mean, one thing I have to say is here we are talking about a film that you're equating to Wizard of Oz. Whatever your personal feelings about him might be from a professional standpoint, he can be very proud of Willy Wonka, I think. You know, you shouldn't be rude to people, right? You shouldn't be mean to people. There are a lot of things that you just shouldn't do. And, and it's possible to be a good director without doing any of those things. I know I've worked with some, but when it comes to the work, when it comes to a lot of takes, that I think it's the, everything else I said is a fair statement. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, well, you know, you came to work, you didn't want to do a lot of takes, but in the end, here we are still talking about this film 50 years later. So from a purely professional standpoint, I back it. You know yeah. what I mean? I back that and Kubrick and anybody else. Again, this is the Christian Bale tirades aside. You know what I mean? So that's another thing, right? I'm talking about just the work. I was doing it right for a while. My dad, who I have no idea what his name is, actually, uh, he's, he was uncredited, the guy who played my father. And I'm talking, of course, about not to your 12, son. Yeah. By the way, maybe people want to see other things that I have. Ooh, oh, oh look, that's, that's like, cool. uh, that's the thumb and the thing picking me up and holding yeah. me there. I started out doing it well. My dad was screwing up a lot, just couldn't get it right. He only had one line. And by the way, it's one of the funnier lines in the film. Not yeah. to your 12, son. Yeah. <laughs> People love it. It gets laughs every time things started coming off the wall. There was a picture that came off the wall, I remember at one point, because they don't really, you know, they just sort of knock it into the wall. It's not even a real wall. And a picture came down. And then I started messing up my lines. And, you know, for whatever reason, it, sometimes there are just technical reasons that have nothing to do with the acting, to do with the shot, if there's a move, yep. you know, the speed of the move. Uh, the composition, the, the sound. I mean, there's a lot of the lights. You could blow a light. So yeah, one way and another, it was a lot of takes. So yeah. getting onto the all-time classic scene at the front of the factory, which yeah. was obviously just a power plant, but they used the front of it and set up as a factory. It was a classic scene, Gene Wilder coming out. You know, we all know that he only did this part if he could do that flip. Yeah. What was that scene like to shoot? We all know it, but I assume that there's like some people that are watching that literally don't know it. Gene Wilder made it part of his contract that he could surprise the audience yeah. by, by limping and then tumbling. And when asked why, he said, because that way they'll never know whether or not they're gonna be able to trust him. He thought that that was important to the character to start that way. That was our first shoot day. I had never met any of the other kids. Denise Nickerson, by the way, was a fellow New York actor kid. So she was bouncing around New York the same time I was. 
uh, but I never met, maybe I met her, but not to my knowledge. And Julie, Michael, Peter, Slugworth was there that day. They yeah. kept him away from us until the shot when we're struggling up to the front and then oh, he looms and suddenly it's him. And of course, you know, they got that guy with the scar and everything. He got a really, really good face for it. So we, you know, that gave us a nice reaction for that one. Watching Gene the first time, I didn't know that he was going to do it any more than, you know, most people. I'll bet the people on the crew probably didn't know that he was going to tumble. In fact, I recall that the way they shot it, they just did the walk up several times. First, just the walk-up. And then eventually, they, you probably realize, had a brick in the walkway there that was styrofoam. So if he hits it just right with his cane, his cane stands straight up. One of the hardest things is the hat. Again, back to the uh, Daft House movie theater. Sometimes the host will dress up as Willy Wonka. And sometimes they will be adventurous or foolish enough to try to do the tumble on their entrance. And it's the hat that's tricky, let me just tell you. Because that's you got to figure out how to get that out of the way while you're tumbling. Anyway, yeah, I was as surprised as anybody else to see him do that, uh, but that was a fun day. They had a brass band there. They had a lot of extras. It was outside. That was a good day. Yeah. And that's one thing I love about this movie is that there's a lot of parts that the actors didn't know was going to happen. Yeah. I mean, the sure. thing is all walk into the, to the factory for the first time. It was yes. actually the first time you walked in. Yes. So first of all, I did not know. Michael did not know. He played uh, Augustus. Peter, who played Charlie, did not know. Uh, Denise, who played Violet. Uh, by the way, I should just mention that Denise uh, Nickerson passed two years now. It could be slightly less than two years now. The other four of us are alive and well. Michael is in Munich, Germany. Peter is a large animal veterinarian in upstate New York. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. And Julie uh, is a uh, therapist, actually, a psychotherapist. She's been working with bereaved uh, children. So that's tough work. Uh, yeah. And Denise worked at SpaceX. She was like a bookkeeper. And uh, she, she worked in a variety of places. So um, I just feel like I should, I should mention Denise and, uh, and the other kids. So uh, yeah, so none of us knew, I should say, I was building up to Julie. Julie actually did know that that was going to happen. So okay. as Julie likes to say, she was the only one acting in that shot. <laughs> we were all actually surprised and uh, aghast and uh, amazed and amused by what we saw. Julie had been asked by uh, Harper Goff who was the brilliant set man. He yeah. was the set designer. And so uh, he was borrowed from Disney. He was the designer on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and made the Nautilus and all of Captain Nemo stuff. So he said, oh, we're made, building this beautiful set, Julie. Would you like to come in? And so uh, she said, sure. And so she went in and other times she would bring her lunch and sit by the river and, and eat her lunch there. Wow. So all of us were very surprised at this gorgeous set that we saw from a height and of course when we first saw it they had the waterfall going and the boat going through the river and the oompa loompas and uh, i mean it was the easiest acting moment ever right all you had to do is drop your jaw and take it in you know and because you can see important. you're coming down the stairs and yeah. you know gene wilder's got the, the cane and he, he whacks yeah. it and you, you go to shock but then you go back into you know Wow. Yeah, so some of that was acting, some of that wasn't. Uh, did any of us get swapped with the with the thing? We did get whacked with the <laughs> cane occasionally. I myself caught it somewhere, you know, but no, not like, you know, <clears throat> you know, just like maybe you get grazed a little bit. And once that happens once, then obviously the acting is easier again. But I mean, if, if I may say uh, somewhat immodestly that because I started acting when I was six and had worked with directors, I was looking at it as an acting task by then. I was going up to the director and saying, what do I think about this? Am I, is it funny to me? Am, who am, I, am I egging her on? Most of the time I was enjoying it. So Augustus goes in the, li the river, splash, I'm gonna be going, whoa, yeah, yeah, because I'm Mike TV. Now, when Gene Wilder is playing the flute, he is telling the Oompa Loompa that he's going to be boiled into fudge. And now Mike TV realizes that this is the treatment of children who do something wrong. If you see me, I'm just at the edge of the shot, but I'm working through that stuff. Yeah. I'm going, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking up and listening and I'm thinking. So in a sense, it's kids are just playing make-believe. But after you've done it for five years, I was a five-year veteran at that point. 
you know that people are going to want you to be thinking about that's how it's done. Like you've seen, you've had conversations with other actors, with directors, and you need to get a result or you can't move on to the next shot. So you actually, by then, have an understanding of what it is. There was some of that and some of it actually was acting. Julie had seen it and, um, oh yes, I know where I was. So I talked to Mel about it afterwards uh, and so did she. We were at dinner. Mel's the director. She told him. He never knew that she had seen it. He, again, as he would do around the table, was like, and I kept the kids from seeing the thing. And that's how we got such priceless reactions out of the children. She couldn't take it anymore. And she told it again. I, you know, I told you that I have sort of a family style image. I try not to curse. So I can't tell you what he said, but I can tell you that it was blue and that it, he was not happy. He yelled at the moment she told him he was, <laughs> you know, he was, he was surprised and not pleased about the fact that she had seen it. And she, he didn't find out for 40 years, but he did eventually find out. So yes, it was the first time for me. No, it wasn't for Julie. And yeah. uh, the director found out later. And did Gene Wilder actually pluck a piece of your hair? Was that real? Too many takes is what happened. So many takes we did. I told you about all his takes. We did, you know, 350 takes and they asked my permission. I do remember this. I have, that's two, I have two standard jokes that I tell. One is too many takes. And the other is this, that they absolutely walked up to me and they said, Mr. Wilder would like to actually pluck a few hairs from your head. I could tell you of a lot of th things that went on, on set. It wasn't, OSHA was not involved at that point. There, uh, you don't know what OSHA is. Um, uh, there were no, the child labor laws were not, and the work safety laws were not then what they are now. And there was a lot of sort of very scary, we'll just drop a bunch of copper pots and pans on them. It'll be fine. It'll be, what's, you know, perfect. They yanked me away and into a thing that had cop, you know, obviously talking about the inventing room. We all had things like that. For some reason, they decided to be polite and they said, look, Paris, you know, we'd like to actually pluck some hairs out of your head. Would that be all right? And I said, I absolutely remember this. I said, sure, I've got plenty. I think I only remember that that's exactly what I said because I've told the story so many times. And unlike other stories, I'm sure that one is true. But oh, here, that's good. Here, look at that. That's a fine head of hair I have. Sorry about the Zoom thing. I got go. Beatles yeah. mop top going on there, you know? My hair started going when I was about college age, right around 19, it was pretty clear. Remember when I was 14, it was down to here? Yeah. Yeah, 19, it was already starting to back up and by like 24, was, you know, I was one of these guys. I did the I did the ponytail for a little while in the 80s and the 90s, something like that. Eventually, one day I just started shaving it and I've been this way and much happier ever since. So the, the scene in the factory where uh, Augustus falls into the river, the chocolate river, obviously the first kid to go, was he upset about that? Michael was a separate case. He, he didn't almost speak any English. He lived in Munich where we shot the film, was talking his lines by rote. I mean, I speak a little bit of, we're not going to, I don't know if we're going to get to my travels, but I've been to 61 countries right, oh, with wow. a back, on my back. So I've been to Sydney. I haven't been to Melbourne. Yep. I've been to 61 countries. And so I speak a little French. I speak a little Spanish. I even speak a little German. He didn't speak any English. So it was just purely by rote. He was not on set very long. He was a nice enough kid. You know, he was just sort of, you know, jolly. He described the water that he fell into as dirty, cold, stinking water. And then they put him in that pipe segment. There was a, a dummy that goes up the pipe, put him in the pipe segment. They did a close up on him with his, you know, he's sort of got brown liquid on him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, those were those were probably difficult. That was probably the most difficult part, the falling in and then the shot in the pipe. So this day was the difficult day because I was on a, a rig, which as you know, is attached here. It straps here, which is never pleasant for a man to be dangling by there. And then they attach these two fingers. I've got another shot somewhere of two German stagehands on whose shoulders I'm standing. This, this is just a different shot. But during that shot, they're, they're taking the relief off of my midsection and they're letting me stand on their shoulders and they're looking very bored. One guy's got a cigarette and they just sort of here and I'm standing on them. That was my uncomfortable day because I would have to dangle there. Peter similarly had to have a flying rig for fizzy lifting drinks. Yep. I know from talking to him that that was his difficult day. Julie's 13th birthday was her goose scene. That was another day of many, many, many takes. I don't know how many. It might even have been more. It might have been in the 50s. There were a lot of takes. It was especially complicated when she has to... It's a big shot where she 
kicks all the she knocks down all the boxes and kicks all the ribbons and she takes the uh, supermarket uh, uh, cart and she spins it, catches it, throws it into the other thing, does something else. And there's a lot that happens in that shot. And that was another multiple take day. So in that sense, it was difficult for her, but then she had to do the rather terrifying egg decator fall. Yeah. So like me and the other dangerous thing I did, which was the pots and pans, we only did it once. They got it on the first shot and they, cause I was, I got up, here's me, right? rambunctious me clatter clatter plying plying i think i even got dinged on the head i didn't care right i stood up and i said predictably enough let's do it again and they said hang on we're you know we're checking the gate the film information okay so there's something in uh in all cameras film cameras 35 millimeter cameras it's called the gate and that's between the plate of glass that's in front of it and the lens and sometimes dust gets in there yep. so what they need to do after every shot because obviously film is exp not it's not just the film, it's the payroll of the, the location and all the people and the big actors and everything. Time is super valuable. And if you do, in fact, have a piece of dust in the gate and you all go home, especially in those days, you couldn't reshoot, you couldn't just fix it in post, yeah. right? The last thing they do is they say, check in the gate, gate's good, moving on. That's what you hear as an actor, right? Yeah. You hear uh, speed, rolling, action, and you hear cut. And when it's the two out from the from the last take of the day, you say it's at the ledge. We're at the ledge. You'll hear it over the. I was in film production for a while. We probably won't get to that part of my life, but I was in film production, so I had the the earwig in my head, and I used to say copy a lot into uh, uh, walkie talkies a lot and that kind of thing. So uh, we're at the ledge, and then the last shot of the day is the martini. Everybody will be like, "Oh, it's the martini, the martini," obviously, because right after this shot time for the martini so they call that shot the martini but in any case when you're so, you're almost done with one shot one angle they say checking the gate gate's good moving on or turning around or also again in australia they probably don't say this but on film sets most people wouldn't know this we say coming about like a ship yeah. instead of saying like if if this was a two-person scene and we got the coverage of me like this and now we want to get the coverage of you. They were turning around. But on sets, a lot of the time they say coming about. And I've even very many times heard it coming to boot. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I jumped up. I said, let's do it again. They said, no, no, no. Hang on. Checking the gate. Gate's good. Moving on. And that was it. I didn't get to do it again. But Julie had to be up there in this very dangerous situation. So I've heard her tell the story. I hate to tell someone else the story, but this is how I heard her tell the story about the exit. She was told that she needs to... Imagine I'm standing. Don't lean forward because you'll smack your head on the front of the thing. Don't lean back because you'll smack your head on the back of the thing. Keep your arms flush to the sides because if your arms are like this, they'll get hit like this. And there might've been one other thing. Oh, and keep singing, keep lip syncing. So she went up there, she stood on the thing. She stepped in just the right place, down the chute, checking the gate, gate's good, moving on and uh, they, she never had to do it again. Now, just one other thing I wanna point out, Roy Kinnear, who boy, the, by the way, was a funny, funny man, like Gene, like Jack Albertson, who by the way, was one of the nicest, those two guys were probably the two nicest guys on the set. The guy who played Julie's dad, Roy Kinnear, was a very funny actor and who died on a horse filming The Three Musketeers. He's tumbled off the horse and died later. I keep going on to these sort of parenthetical statements, but I became friendly with his son, Rory Kinnear, who people will know from, from TV and, and stage. I saw him in a play in London, became, we became friendly. So Rory Kinnear is Roy Kinnear's son and uh, he's becoming a famous actor now and a good guy. So uh, Roy and Jack were very nice folks. I think is probably the funniest actor of any of them. He had to do the stunt forward, head oh. first. He <laughs> says, oh, Veruca, and he goes forward. And this thing, I mean, it's a six foot drop with some cardboard things, you know, whatever they tried to make it kind of cushy at the bottom, but forward, boom, oh. you know? So that was Julie's toughest day and Denise's toughest day was definitely the large styrofoam ball that they built around her and cut in half and then carved her impression out of on both halves of the ball, if I've made that clear, and then strapped the ball together and then built her suit back on top of the ball. And then, you know, she's just splayed there. It seems like a torture device in this position I'm in, right? Like a rack. Yeah. So there she is and she can wiggle her hands and her feet and that's about it. They would turn her periodically so her blood wouldn't pool. I remember it was too hard to get her out of there for lunch. So we all went to lunch and she was just like there, you know, and that, I think of the five of us, she had it toughest. I think 
her toughest day was tougher than any of the other tough days. Being in that thing, she complained of back problems afterwards. I think that was actually like they crossed the line there. You know, you want to put her into it carefully and get her out carefully. You got to have a system for that. Like Velcro probably wasn't invented in 1974. So I think Denise's was the toughest of all. Actually, going back to the Oompa Loompas just quickly. Did, yes. you, did you meet the Oompa Loompas before you guys got into the factory? I did. I saw them. I definitely remember seeing them before they were presented to us. Saw them one day. I have a photo of me in my Mike TV outfit, and they've got uh, tissue paper here to protect their costume from the orange paint. You know, I mean, the question that I get asked is, was I freaked out by them? I mean, not exactly. You know, first of all, it's obvious to me that they're not, in fact, orange with green hair. So that whole thing is not. I think kids have curiosity when they see little people for the first time. Here I experienced some of that. I remember I was with my mom, you know, we probably had a quick conversation about it. And eventually, you know, you just you forget about it like anything else, you know, yeah. I mean, very nice guys. So there were 10 on Uh They cast them all over Europe. As I understand, they found some of them in circuses. They were international. There were nine men, one woman. Her name was Pepe. They okay. were Turkish. One was a Spaniard, I think, uh, several Brits. In one scene... I want to say the the inventing room. There were kids dressed as Oompa Loompas to, to sort of flesh out their numbers and make it seem like there were more of them. Historically, many people probably know that they were pygmies. They were African pygmies in the book. And that was not, uh, even in 1974, that was not something that people wanted to put on film. It wasn't, you know, the idea of these, because slavery, you know, I yeah. mean, yeah. not a good idea. So they needed to come up with something that would make it more palatable than that would seem on screen, less shocking. I mean, there are other words I'd like to use, you know, <laughs> less beep, like less beep up, right? <laughs> Beeped up, <laughs> less beeped up than that would have been. So they came up with this idea. What if we just give them green hair and orange? Fine. So they're kind of like, not exact, exactly aliens, but people from another land. I mean, honestly, in 2021, even the story they came up with is beeped up. Whether they're black or orange, they still went to this island and brought them and put them into indentured servitude. I mean, there's a whole other side of the whole Willy Wonka tale. If you take a PC lens and decide to look at Willy Wonka from that side, believe me, I've had a lot of conversations with people about Grandpa Joe. Have you read any of this? Yeah, I, I, I'm really um, curious about that because they don't like him. Yeah, and they're, some oh. of them are very sort of vehement about it also. I mean, to me, they're kind of focusing on a character that really is trying to be inherently good and they're, and they're amplifying his bad qualities. But yeah. if any of you have not seen the anti-Grandpa Joe, and I already told you that, Joe, that uh, Jack Albertson was one of the nicest guys yeah. on set, right? So he's, in my mind, 100% safe. So the, the, the slam on Grandpa Joe is that he lay in bed, didn't get a job, X number of years. When he did spend money, it was on pipe tobacco, which, you know, okay, that's another thing. Yeah. And then when there's something on the line that he wants to do, he leaps out of bed and says, what about me? Let's go. At the end of the film, you know, there's a line, Blanca is like, you know, you can, you can come, I want you to live at the factory. And Grandpa Joe says, and me? <laughs> and, you know, there are a few moments like that. There's also a nail that he has, which is long, grown long, about this long, which I have, I, I cannot tell you why Jack Albertson's nail was untrimmed that day. I can tell you that the internet has decided that it's his coke nail, right? Okay, so there's that. There's, did Raul Dahl like children? I actually, this is another one of these things. I don't remember whether I met him or not. I probably saw him because okay. he was on set. Yep. Julie says uh, that she had lunch with him. And okay. She describes him as very tall yeah. and rather imperious, which makes sense if you've ever seen any footage of him. He certainly, except for Charlie, he puts these other kids through the ringer. I mean, there's that. And then Willy Wonka. I mean, he is charming. He is charming AF. And he is also rather sinister all of this talking about the, the tunnel scene did you ask me about that yeah that's what I want. so do you remember much about that scene okay so they didn't know uh, tell us we didn't know that was coming we just knew that we had already been exposed to chickens getting their heads cut off and things climbing across their face 
probably some other stuff that didn't make the final cut that I've blocked out yeah. that in a sort of clockwork orange like fashion they're showing us while yeah. we're now up on high on this set piece which they're rocking and they're flashing lights <laughs> If you think about it, it's really, I've never described it as clockwork orange like before, but I think that's really kind of, the only thing they didn't do is the thing like this. Yes. So it's really kind of an apt, an apt parallel in a way. So now here comes Gene, who from the beginning of the film, from day one, I've already told you he's tumbling and we don't know whether to trust him or not. Now he does the poem in the way that he does. I mean, honestly, I think that I, I had already been able to sort of come to the idea that he was friend, not foe. Yeah. by then but nonetheless the way that he did the read of that poem uh which is not as many of the literary references are not they are not original to Willy Wonka they are grabs from Shakespeare and from I think Robbie Burns or I Arthur can't. O'Shaughnessy and different different people you know some some of the most beautiful language from the film already existed in the world they were just smart enough to I can't remember the name of the character that Christopher Plummer played in the Star Trek series, but he had the same thing. He, he liked to grab bits of Shakespeare and weave it into his character. So anyway, his read was, was somewhat terrifying or at the very least disconcerting. I was, for one of the very few times, given the go-ahead to full-on not be happy with my surroundings uh, in the tunnel when I'm shooting at things and I'm clinging to my mother. It's sort of the only part of the, of the factor that really phases me is the tunnel. So yeah, it was, you know, a little creepy, but you know, you're 11, creepy is fun, right? It was all fun. This is something I haven't said yet in the interview. Going and being on Willy Wonka at the Chocolate Factory was personally, emotionally, from a travel standpoint, professionally, in every way, a great, great experience. I was lucky, lucky, lucky. Basically, they built a little theme park. It wasn't built all at once. They would build the set and then we'd go and play in that set. And then meanwhile, they're on stage three and they're making another set. They're making a room that gets smaller when you walk into it, or they're making a car that spouts gouts of foam when you ride it. I mean, the fact that it still is popular after all these years is not lost on me. The fact that so many people around the world in various languages have each of them, because of the magic of film, their own relationship to the film, their own love for the film, their own reason. They were, they were ill and it was the thing that they watched over and over again to get them through. They watched it with their children or with their family or on and on and on. I've heard as people have come up and talked to me, I've heard endless stories of reasons that people love it. And so I'm, I'm very lucky to have been associated with a film that is so well loved. And not only is it a well loved film, but making it was super fun. And just going back to what you were saying, um, yes. I remember the first time that I watched it with my daughter and she would have been five, six, just such a happy thing to do with your child. You sit yes. There and watch that movie. Yes. I will say that six is a little young. Well, it was, you know, six, I, I can't remember exactly, but it was a... It was... And, and having said that, there there are worse things out there right now, <laughs> probably, that in, just in the commercials, probably. I'll tell you what the age six means to me in terms of Willy Wonka. I hope there are no six-year-olds watching. Okay, so here you go. If you're, if you're watching with a five-year-old, go tell them out of the room for a second or something. You know, I mean, just go like this, whatever you need to do, okay? Yeah. This is for the adults. Now I'm going to say this. Spoiler alert, no kids. So the reason I'm saying that is this. I've had people come up to me at conventions because I've done a lot of pop culture conventions, comic cons, yeah. and they'll bring their kid up and they are five or they're four. And they will say, look, honey, you know the movie we like to watch together, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? You know, Mike TV, the little kid? That's him. The kid looks at me and they go, and they're like, no, no, real that that's it. And I, I try to tell the parents, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you don't want to, it's a little too early. And they're like, oh no, no, they love this movie. And they press on, right? And they keep doing it. And then the kids go on, ah, ah, ah. now they're like crying, right? So what's happening is, and this is why I tried to send the kids away, 
It's the Santa Claus effect. Yeah. What you're telling them is this is not the char the char the character in the screen is now this adult who looks to him nothing like him. Number one, how can I be outside of the movie screen or the or the TV? Number two, why do I why am I old? It's just disorienting and it's like stomping, not, not stomping on, but it's, it's, it's bursting the bubble. Seven, you're pretty much okay. Yeah. Six is like borderline, five is like right out. Don't even try it, <laughs> don't do it. If you bring your kids to a Comic-Con, leave them alone. <laughs> if they don't wanna, if they don't seem to get it, just let them be. The start of the movie where he's, Charlie's brought the bread in, and it's like, it just sends a message throughout the whole movie that just be nice. The, the movie is a morality play, basically. Hmm. It's good, good things happen to good people and bad people, I was going to say go to hell. But in any case, they, <laughs> they, you know, things don't go well for them. Uh, oh, this sort of ties into what we were talking about with Jack Albertson, Seven Deadly Sins. People ask me, is it Seven Deadly Sins? There's gluttony, there's greed, there's, there's avarice, there's, you know, the, no, it's not that direct, but yeah. It's kind of like the movie Seven. It's set up in a very deliberate way. This is one of the reasons that it's as popular as it is. The structure of it, first of all, it's something that they call uh, the hero's journey, which I don't know if you know about the hero's journey, but most of many of our major things are an epic mythological form called the hero's journey. Think, for instance, of Odysseus. The, the hero starts in his own sort of meager surroundings or wherever he is and he starts at home and then he goes off and he goes on a journey he's tested there he has various adventures he usually meets an advisor like a an obi-wan or a uh a yoda or a uh, who is it for harry potter dumbledore right there's usually an older figure merlin right this person advises them and then they go through all these adventures and then they come to back from their odyssey and they come back home and uh in the case of tolkien and frodo he, uh, in the book, has to fight the uh, Shire. There's a scene in the Shire where the bad guys are there and they have to drive them out. In the case of Odysseus, his wife is being beset by a bunch of suitors and he has to get rid of all of those guys. But anyway, when he comes home and he solves the situation at home, he's changed and he's a new man and he's a different guy. So Charlie is that, right? He starts here, he goes, he has his adventures. Charlie doesn't particularly learn the lesson, but his life changes. He gets the factory and things are going to be different now that he's home again. And in a sense, it's a rite of passage. So it's that, but it's also very much morality tale, which is uh, almost biblical in a sense that sinners, essentially, yeah. who, um, who do the wrong thing and uh, get their comeuppance. You could also say uh, Dante's Inferno. I mean, it's really, as you can hear from the examples I'm giving you, Alice, they're, they're everywhere. And it's, it's a really important, you know, Luke, obviously, and it's conscious. You know, when people are making films, that's a, a, a conscious. I'm thinking of the kid now uh, who wrote Aragon. You know, that movie about the dragon is written by like a 15 year old or whatever, A Hero's Journey. There's actually a brilliant work about this. The guy who I learned about it, I want to say his name is Joseph Conrad. I hope I'm not saying that wrong because one of the Conrads wrote Heart of Darkness and the other one is the anthropologist guy, the sociologist guy. Anyway, there's two Conrads. So not the one that, that wrote uh, Heart of Darkness that uh, Apocalypse Now is based on. The other one, uh, he wrote uh, interesting stuff about uh, sociology and, and the so history. The, the Wonka Mobile, uh, which I wanted to talk about, what was that scene like to shoot? So this is after they're gone. I, it's just me and Charlie now. So Denise and Julie and Peter are all gone. I'm still there. I'm there for nine weeks. So I'm coming up. It was shot mostly in sequence because that way they could release the kids when they needed to, when they were done. I sat in front. I had a tuba protuberance in front of me, which along with the thing up top that hit Wilder was the largest, I think even more than Wilder. I think that Dodo Denny, who played my mother and has passed and is, was a lovely woman, she called me Mina Kleine Mouse. And she gave me a little stuffed mouse at one point. I don't think it was a real mouse, but a little <laughs> toy. She and I sat up front and just gouts of this foam covered us. It was a big orifice and it was coming hard out of there. And what it was, was fire extinguisher foam that they would lay onto tarmacs so oh, that if a, play okay. came in, a plane came in without its landing gear, it would help with the friction and it would just wow. slide in to a safe landing. And several of the adults got rashes. Uh, oh. Everyone was cold. I was fine. 
I was same thing. I was like, let's go, let's go. Because yeah, I shared that with my character. You know, my character was like, let's do it again. I was the same way. I was like, yeah, put me in the thing, cover me with foam, let's go. How often are you going to get to do that? When I was uh, in my 40s, for about a year after doing some film production work, I, I, I fell in with the folks over at The Good Wife. For a while, I was a lawyer in the background. So if you watch closely, there are probably 20 episodes or 30 episodes where I've got a, a briefcase. Okay. And I, a suit. I owned a bunch of suits from when I was a stockbroker for six years. It's Smith Barney. You can catch me. You can see me walking around, going from here to there, That's you know, cool. back to one, back to one. Did they say that one in Australia? Back to one? No, no. <laughs> well, you don't work on a film set, so or do yeah, you? Probably, maybe they do. But yeah. uh, maybe they do. I wouldn't be. I'd be surprised. Some of these things are probably in Australia. Back to one just means your number one position. So you walk, 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 cut back to one, and you go back, and then you start again. Going back to Jack Albertson, because I've actually got it on my okay. list here to, you know, I wanted to talk to you about him because, you know, he looks yeah. like an absolute gentleman to work with. What was he like to work with as an actor? Is Fantastic. Yeah. He was wonderful. He was great. He was the oldest guy on set. Yeah. And he was a vaudeville actor. And he was just a lovely guy. I mean, imagine a high energy, not high energy, uh, that sounds like me, not broken down by old age yeah. is what I mean. Very... <laughs> Uh, vivacious and funny and was kind and spent time with us as kids right. and played with us. You know what I mean? Like a good guy. I was going to touch on Jeopardy 2018. You did an episode of Jeopardy with uh, I did. Trebek. I did. I did not win. Unfortunately, I missed a question on the Taiwan Strait. I missed a lot of questions, but right near the end, when I was just at a point where I could like bet it all if I, you know, it was a daily double. And I didn't get it. I, I actually, in my training, because I trained, I read books, I read lists, I, uh, you know, I wanted to do well. Yeah. I studied and I somehow, I did look at the Taiwan Strait at one point uh, in my studies, but when he asked me what it was, I've even been to Taiwan as I've traveled to so many places and I could see the large island in the South China Sea. See, it's your part of the world. It probably makes sense to you. China, it's right over there. And then for some reason, Hainan, which is a small island over here, I could think of that. I just couldn't think of Taiwan. And Alex was like, I'm going to need an answer. And I was like, Hainan, I know it's not Hainan, but whatever, here, Hainan. And it was Taiwan. And so then in Final Jeopardy, I got it right. I mean, literally that question, I could have won. Missed it by that much. Was it fantastic? Yeah, it was great. Great fun. I'm a gamer. I like um, board games. I mean, I don't know how far I'd have to reach to find a board game. I'm not in the right room for this. But if I was in a different room, I would go, look, there is 150 board games. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. Yeah. Now, I like board games. I like conundrums, puzzles, history, trivia. Yeah, it was, it was just the kind of thing I like to do. I tried very hard to win. I didn't win. Alex was very nice. I didn't have much interface with him. Okay. He said some nice things to me, uh, you know, about things I could have done better or something like that, but it was all, it was all good. We took a photo together. Uh, obviously, uh, he will be missed. Two days ago, the man who was the most recent five-time champion who played with Alex also died at tw age oh, 24. Oh, yeah. Alex, I mean, you know, yeah. guy was in the, in the game show world and in the trivia world, he was a legend. So yeah. uh, again, I was lucky I was able to be with him and lose before he passed just before we go what's what was the most memorable moment on Willy Wonka I would like to think of something that I hadn't already talked about but probably the two most memorable moments were seeing the imagination room for the first time and then once we got to the bottom of the stairs we got to go out into it for you it's like go down the stairs and go into the room for us it was like take after take of making our way down the stairs maybe a whole day in any case half a day I'm sure before they then said, okay, you kids go run into the room. And they just wanted to see where we'd go. And then they gave us a pattern, whether it was the same we ran or not, you know, to go yeah. to. That was a great day. And then also the stunt. I like the stunts. I like getting hit on the head. I like the foam. <laughs> boat. The boat was fun. Before they put it in the tunnel, they had it running on a cable underneath the Chocolate River, like oh, Pirates of the Caribbean. The boat was fun. I'm struggling to find a day that wasn't, wasn't memorable fun. and fun. 
in thanks a little so much for your time, time, Paris. Really appreciate it. I know we've gone over time, so I do thank you for that. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me, and uh, it's been fun.